we are discussing the Manchester bombings with Rusi experts Dr. Raffaella Pantucci, who is the Director of International Security here at Rusi, and Emily Winterbottom, who is a Senior Research Fellow here at Rusi. It's been 24 hours. You both have been analysing, commenting on the media heavily on, on this tragedy. Um, walk us through what's happened so far in terms of what we know about the bomber uh, Salman Abedi uh, and um, the investigation. Well, to get us started, um, I would say that at the moment we are getting a very patchy picture about what actually happened. But the sort of details which are slowly coming out seem to be crystallizing around the fact that we have an individual who appears to have been traveling abroad until fairly recently, returned to the United Kingdom, possibly from Libya and maybe elsewhere in the past three days. Um, a person who was originally from Manchester and from the Libyan community there, um, who then seems to have decided to launch a bomb attack on uh, this Ariana Grande concert as it was finishing in Manchester's um, arena. Um, the device he appears to have used was a bomb that was packed into a suitcase full of nails, uh, which detonated in the crowd and has killed at least 22 people. I think at the last count, and some 60 have been injured. Um, and Emily, obviously questions are now being asked uh, ne inevitably from how did this person get through to the usual question about, you know, are current policies working? Where, where, where do you think the conversation is going and what do we need to do next? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the kind of first 24 hours after an event like this, the kind of first priority of the police and uh, the intelligence services is to try and find out who this man is and whether he has connections. Um, and I think, you know, this morning, Amber Rudd, uh, the Home Secretary, came out quite strongly saying the priority now is on looking at potentially um, whether another attack may be imminent um, and exploring, you know, his background in more detail as a kind of secondary concern at the moment. Um, I mean, I think the simple fact is we have been told for a number of years that an attack um, was not a matter of if, but when. Um, we have done, you know, the kind of British uh, intelligence and security services have done a lot over the last number of years under the contest counterterrorism strategy we have. Um, but the simple fact is, is people do slip through the net. Um, in terms of moving forward, Amber has also mentioned you know, pumping a lot more into prevent, for example, um, or, although that has been a highly debated subject. Is now the time to talk about that? And if so, where, where are the contours of the discussion going? Right? I mean, I think, uh, I think that the current discussion at the moment, which we heard this morning when we had the Home Secretary talk about an uplift for prevent, I mean, in a way, it's a bit of a, it sounds like a, a slight red herring. Because when we talk about an uplift of prevent, we're talking about a portion of the overall CT budget, which is, I think, around 1% or so. The overwhelming majority of counterterrorism spend takes place in the hard security aspects, in the agencies, in the pursue, protect, and prepare side of counterterrorism. When you're looking at the prevent side, it actually is a very small part of the budget. Now, invariably, it would be a good thing to increase, and it would be good if we did see more resources going towards trying to figure out how we could steer people off the path of radicalization in the first place. But I think, you know, fundamentally, when you're dealing with these problems in the heat of a situation like this, it's probably not exactly the appropriate time to be thinking about these sorts of levels of detail. At the moment, the focus is very much on trying to understand this plot, understand this individual, who else he knew. Um, from the current sort of investigation, we seem to think, or the investigators seem to be concluding that he didn't make the device himself, which means that there's a bomb maker out there who has managed to build a device and deliver it successfully. There will be a great deal of concern in identifying this individual, making sure he's not connected to other people who might be launching other attacks. And I think that's one of the many reasons why we've seen the uh, government raise the threat level to critical yesterday. Let's quickly talk about the intelligence and intelligence gathering vis-a-vis -vis other countries. One of the things that we are getting a lot of calls about is um, the US, the, uh, America's role, and um, them sharing British intelligence, even though Apparently, the British authorities have asked not for that information not to be divulged. Where is the state of intelligence sharing between these two countries? I mean, the Five Eyes community yeah. is very tight. Yes. And, you know, and the Five Eyes includes the US and UK, and they are very close in terms of their capabilities, in terms of the operations that they do together. I mean, the United States, of course, has a massive operation that the United Kingdom is very close to and adds a very good niche aspect to. But there has always been a slight tension between the two. 
Um, on the one hand, there is a sort of a tradition in some ways or a belief that in the British system there is a, a desire more to watch operations, understand networks and play a sort of longer game. Um, whereas in the United States, there's maybe a slightly more aggressive posture of disrupting networks quickly, getting them off the streets and moving on to the next one. And that tension has sometimes expressed itself between the two sides of the Atlantic. I think the current frustration seems to be around the fact that the information around Salman Abedi, and specifically his name, appears to have leaked from the American side, mm -hmm. uh, at a point at which maybe investigators in the UK were more keen to keep that under wraps, to allow them to do their jobs. Mm. And then really, um, moving back the conversation back here, and you know, there's been a con talk about communities one could be doing more in terms mm -hmm. of reporting uh, potential threats out there. On the other hand, we've heard, you know, one minute we hear reporting is good. For example, weeks after the Westminster attack, the chap who got arrested just outside Rusi mm -hmm. was uh, somebody who got arrested as a result of a tip-off. Um, on the other hand, we're hearing, well, Salman Abedi was known to authorities, um, uh, but, you know, here he was um, doing what he did. Where, what is the state of play in terms of reporting? Yeah, I mean, the reporting side actually kind of leads back to the kind of previous question about the prevent mm -hmm. component of this. Um, you know, and it's, it's actually one of the more controversial aspects of the UK's prevent strategy, that it has a kind of component which is built on encouraging people to report mm -hmm. if they're concerned about an individual. Um, and that can be across, you know, the social services, but also, you know, there's been resistance from teachers saying that they don't want to be participating in this, also hospitals, doctors, um, to, of course, fam family members, friends, family. Um, so I think, you know, it's actually very difficult to find a balance between encouraging people that they know where they can go if there are... Um, you know, if they are concerned, but not only concerned because they want to report something, but they're concerned because they might want help. You know, we might be very much in the prevent stage of this, um, you know, that someone might be showing signs that are concerning, but, you know, has no actual intention to become violent in any case. Uh, so it is uh, something that I think there is a bit of a tension between uh, whether you you know, whether you can encourage, I mean, I think, I don't know, looking at the French model, I think in the aftermath of Paris, you know, one of the uh, key steps they brought in was <coughs> allo terrorism. Um, and, you know, research that we did in France, that was constantly referred to. People were like, well, what's countering violent extremism? What's preventing violent extremism? Does it just amount to allo terrorism, which is, you know, a statement within a number that you should call? Um, and that was also felt as bringing you know, bringing communities too, too close to law enforcement, which maybe they don't have the kind of necessary trust in either. Mm. I mean, I think there's a separation uh, between sort of terrorism tip-off lines, which is something that the, you know, police run, which is for people to sort of flag up their concerns, and the sort of prevent work that is focused on building community links and building community relations. I think the key thing, and this has always been a tension with prevent, is whether prevent is actually something that is trying to work with communities, trying to understand and steer people off the path of radicalization, or is it just a sort of giant state plan to try to spy on communities, quite frankly? Um, and that tension has always <coughs> sort of existed between the two. Um, and so I think, you know, separating that out and distinguishing it is going to be key. I mean, my increasing view of prevent is that it is something that should be outside the criminal justice space. You know, I think that when you're looking at prevent in particular and what you're talking about doing is trying to basically engage with people before they've entered the criminal justice process. And so it should be something that isn't necessarily managed by a criminal justice organization like the Home Office or the police. It should be something that maybe should be managed by someone else and that someone else is able to help get people and give people the confidence that when they're engaging with this program, which is fundamentally about trying to stop people from ending up joining with horrible groups that want them to commit atrocities like the one we saw in Manchester, um, it is something that they have confidence isn't going to be engaging necessarily with the criminal justice process, but is genuinely a way of getting people off that track earlier. Yeah. No, I mean, I just would add, we, you know, we, we talk a lot about um, this in work we do, and it really is bringing it back to what we would call local and credible voices and, mm. and you know, figures and organisations, um, and that does tend to kind of lie outside uh, the formal criminal system and potentially, you know, has a greater role for civil society actors. 
um, and organisations that work, you know, actually at the grassroots. Let's just talk about the this individual's supposed international connections. Um, we're hearing the Libyan one on the one hand. There was something out earlier from the French intelligence services about uh, possible links to Syria. Mm. How significant are these foreign links, and do, do, does this person follow typologies that you've been you have been following? Um, I think that uh, the foreign link is going to be a really important one to completely nail down because I think if we're looking at a plot where we have an individual who's been sent from abroad to launch this attack um, and has maybe gone abroad to receive training, then that is a fairly substantial operation that, we're on, that we've seen and it's a difference in many ways to a lot of the plots that we've successfully seen get through. Halid Massoud, the chap who drove his car into the crowds and murdered P.C. Palmer in front of uh, Westminster um, just over a month ago, uh, was someone who appeared to be much more of the kind of homegrown, you know, isolated individual, may have been on the fringes of investigations, but seems to have acted broadly by himself. If we're back to a situation that there are directed plots coming from abroad to attack uh, the United Kingdom, then that's really quite worrying. Um, and it shows that there is sort of a need to have a better understanding of the networks we're looking at. The other thing to remember about foreign links like this is studies have shown that in operations or plots where you have individuals who've received training abroad, you tend to end up with far more effective uh, terrorist plots in terms of their sort of capacity. Because the people have received training, they know what they're doing, they're much more indoctrinated, they're much more directed in the sort of attacks that they undertake. Um, and so I think understanding what that is and what his connection is, and then crucially understanding who else is in that network, um, is I think going to be the real key to making sure that this is just one incident rather than one of a potential number. Yeah. Mm. And I mean, I think the concern always is, um, you know, we, we, despite the fact that obviously Daesh or Islamic State has claimed this, we, we don't actually know mm. um, if they were behind it. You know, they do have a, a tendency to claim things that they um, have very little um, involvement in. Um, but I think, you know, as Raphael says, it's about trying to explore if there are those international links um, and going back to the call that Daesh did have um, last year, which was for people to actually stop travelling to Syria and Iraq, where the space for their existence, you know, is contracting, um, but to stay within Europe, within the UK, um, and to conduct attacks there. And that, so I think that, you know, identifying that link will be important because it has further implications um, for what will happen as Daesh is, you know, further constricted uh, in Syria and Iraq. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important point. I think the point is, that as you see the space shrinking out there, where are these people going to go? Some of them are going to go to other battlefields like Libya or Egypt or Afghanistan, but some are going to head home and understanding that sort of pattern. But then the other aspect, which I are think... Are they starting to head home now, do you think? Yes, I think there's, uh, there are some who are already coming back. Uh, we've seen that flow going on for some time. The exact numbers, I think, are very difficult to nail down. And I think it's going to be a big job for the security services across Europe to stay on top of that. But actually, there's another side to this coin, which is the, the sort of drivers of why people want, the impulses of why people want to go join these groups in the first place, hasn't really gone away from the communities here. And then you have a concern of, but it's become much harder to travel. So for individuals to leave the country and go to a battlefield like Syria and Iraq, it's actually quite difficult these days. As we just saw this morning, uh, police arrested someone at Stansted who was trying to go to Syria. Um, and just last week, someone else was convicted for nine years, or actually the day, sorry, of the Manchester attack, someone was convicted for, I think, uh, it was six or nine years for going to fight in Syria and Iraq. So we're seeing that the ability to travel is becoming restrained, but the impulse still exists. So that means you've got people who are potentially frustrated travelers, where their impulse is there, but their inability to act it out by going abroad is, is complicated by the fact that they can't travel. So what does that mean? You've then got radicalized people here who have the aspiration to participate with these groups but can't join them and might decide to ultimately uh, do something here. And I think that does set a new set of uh, individuals of potential concern. What do we do with those individuals of potential concern? Or is that too early to speculate? I mean, that, that's part of the, the broader, you know, kind of counter-terrorism strategy mm. that, that we've been exploring. I would just ask, though, isn't, <coughs> have, haven't some of the successful attacks by so-called homegrown terrorists been those uh, of people who have tried to travel mm. and haven't been able to? Weren't there links with, particularly, yeah. I'm thinking of the Paris attacks? Um, I think in the Paris attacks, it seemed as though a lot of the attackers have been sent back to launch the operation that they did. But I think in the case here, we can think of, there was a case done in uh, Luton of some individuals who were going to try to attack some soldiers off um, 
of one of the RAF bases around there. And at least one of those people was a frustrated traveler who'd attempted to get out, but had sort of been unable to. Um, and there's been some evidence in some other cases as well. Um, we may remember um, just prior to the Manchester uh, incident, there was, a incident, there, was some there was some arrests here in, the UK, in London. Um, and there was a group of three women who were prosecuted, who were charged as part of that in launching some sort of an attack. But some of the other figures who were in that sort of wider network appeared to be individuals who had traveled, got as far as Turkey, in fact, okay. at which point they had been turned back from traveling. And so then they were able to identify the other three. Uh, yes, I mean, I think the, the entry point into the investigation, uh, I, I don't know the exact detail, but I think the fundamental point of we have already started to see some of these frustrated travellers turning up. And if you think back to Canada a couple of years ago, there was people there, uh, Martin couture Holo, who'd actually tried to travel, been unable to, and ended up driving his car into St. Police yes. um, in Quebec. Yes. Um, so we've seen that sort of phenomenon express itself before. Um, so I think it's just, I think one has to bear in mind that there's, a very worrying combination of factors at play of the kind of lone actors in the Khalid Massoud style, of the kind of block travelers who are people who can't get away, and then the people who have been abroad and are coming back, yeah. um, which is leaving you with a very sort of worrying combination of individuals yeah. who have links, who don't have links, who. Range of methods. Yeah. Exactly, I think that's another key yeah. is the threshold of what constitutes an attack now is so low and so random in some ways a car, a knife. Um, it's very difficult, I think, for a security service to be able to completely stay on top of that entire picture. Yeah, I think that's a reality. Mm -hmm. I think, finally, with the few minutes we have, um, as analysts, you mentioned that this security service have been warning about this for four years. So, is this attack significant, or is this a does this mark a new watershed? Will you, as analysts, be looking at this as a uh, as a, a new chapter in uh, counterterrorism analysis? I mean, I, I, I find the word new always a bit problematic mm. in this field anyway because um, there are links and practices. <coughs> um, so I don't necessarily feel that this is something new. I think it's a, a new, a kind of a different phase. Um, obviously, the nature of the, the attack itself, the kind of targeting, um, I mean, we were talking about this earlier, but of, of children uh, is something which is deeply shocking. Um, but you know, the 7 7 bombs are on a tube, um, indiscriminate killing. So, uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that this is, uh, I don't want to say the word unsurprising, but you know, they have done this elsewhere. Uh, we saw it in Paris with the Bataclan. Uh, we see it constantly uh, in conflict zones. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sadly not very surprised by it, um, but this will. This marks the kind of continued intent, I think, of those um, who are willing to use violence to be indiscriminate and, you know, inflict mass civilian casualties. I mean, I think that the incident will, in the British context, invariably cause, be seen as some sort of a new watershed moment. Because when you're looking at an incident like this, that has been so successful, with so many people killed in such a brutal way, and the fact that this is the most successful attack we've seen in the United Kingdom so since 7-7, which is 12 years ago now, um, I think people will use it as a kind of new marker. I think the other thing is that these, you know, I think there was a perception, maybe in the, in the terrorism analysis community or terrorism community here in the UK, that the threat picture had moved quite firmly towards where lone actors and individuals as where the locus of the threat really lay, and so that was kind of the unknown space that people were trying to chart. If we see an attack like this, where we have a sort of networked plot of some sort leading to bombs and mass casualties, um, you seem to be reverting to a form that we've seen before, which suggests that things have evolved in a direction that obviously um, authorities didn't have a total grip on. And the concern will be, well, if this one happened, what other ones could there be? Um, I think we have to remember that if you look at the 7-7 incident, it came at a moment when there was a whole series of quite large-scale attempts in the United Kingdom. The question is, is that what we're going to start seeing now? And so will this be a new kind of peak moment that then will sort of peter off? And I think you know, the point that uh, Emily was making about the sort of consistent nature of this, I think that's really key. I think it is one of these problems which is going to consistently appear and occasionally express itself. And I think a large scale attack like this will always be seen as a kind of a significant watershed moment at which people will start to revisit a lot of assumptions, look again at what's going on and try to make sure that the processes in place are suitable to manage the threat in the way that we now see it expressing itself. But sadly, a, a possible feature of life. I mean, I think, 
unfortunately terrorism as a threat to society has sort of always existed in mm. some shape or form. Um, in the UK, I'm sure we all remember the IRA and their sort of regular campaigns here. Um, the extreme right wing also exists in, in, in the British context as well. So, you know, we've consistently got sort of political violence expressing itself. Um, I think it's a question of how, as a society, we make sure that we manage this down to its smallest place possible and continue on uh, with um, our daily lives as normal. Good. Well, Rach, Emily, thank you thank so you. much for your time. Thank